In Buffalo, 500 brave Americans are trailing for to go, singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds, I ho. All the way you're running gear and blow, boys, blow. They'll send you to New Bedford, a famous whaling port, and give you to some land sharks to board and pitch you out, singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds, I ho. All the way you're running gear and blow, boys, blow. Good evening. Welcome to Dateline Boston. Tonight we explore still another aspect of the great whaling days out of New Bedford, Massachusetts. The influence on whaling, its contribution to America's cultural and artistic heritage. Now here is the librarian of the Free Public Library in New Bedford, James S. Healy. Jim? Thank you. And with us tonight, we have with us uh, Professor Ted Wood of MIT, Professor of English at MIT, who by the way, is the man who sings that very fine opening and closing pieces for us. Good to have you with us, Ted. Thank you. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the cultural and artistic heritage of whaling. It was a hard, tough life. It was one in which they worked very hard, and in which you might not expect that there was much, well, culture come out of it. But on the contrary, a great deal did. There were, let's say, two forms of culture. The the very formal culture of painting, the New Bedford in the 1800s, rather, was a very important art colony. And of course, the architectural uh, heritage of New Bedford, which was made possible by the money brought in by the whale ships and so on. And of course, there was the, the popular culture, so-called, of uh, scrimshaw, the carving of whale bone, and of course, the very, very well-known whaling ballads and whaling songs. Uh, Ted, uh, I, 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 you know, there are lots of songs, but what, what kind of songs do they have, and what do they use them for? Well, they used to sing in the forecastle, the news themselves, the ballads, sentimental ballads, uh, and songs about their own profession. And uh, they also sang, when on deck and working, uh, the shanties. Mm -hmm. uh, these they didn't think of as songs, they're more shouts, but uh, some of them are rather, rather extraordinary. I might, I might sing a couple here. Of course, they weren't sung to guitar accompaniment, we're putting this up a little bit here. I had a dream the other night. Lowlands, lowlands, away my John. My love, she came all dressed in white. My lowlands, away. She spoke, no word she said. Lowlands, lowlands, away, my John. And then I knew my love was dead. My lowlands, away. Now that was one kind. That, that was a captain's shanty that was sung as they were walking around the captain, hauling up the anchor. I see. But they had some more rhythmical ones for uh, hauling on sheets and halyards, things like this. Way haul away, we'll hang and haul together. Way haul away, we'll haul away. Once I had a Spanish gal, but she was fat and lazy. Way haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Then I had an Irish gal, she nearly drove me crazy. Way haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Now when I was a little boy, then my father told me, Way haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. But if I didn't kiss the girls, my lips would all go moldy. Way haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. Way haul away, we'll hang and haul together. Way haul away, we'll haul away. 
Mr. H. said, you know, my father never told me <clears throat> stories like that. I may have missed something. <laughs> I turn from Ted for just a few moments to talk about the, the formal aspect of the heritage of whaling and the artistic heritage. We turn first to the architecture. Now, New Bedford, of course, in the early 1800s was a very wealthy community. The money brought in by whaling made New Bedford the third most important city on the East Coast. And this money was used to build some very fine, outstanding buildings. First of all, we're going to look at tonight is a customs house in New Bedford. These buildings you'll see now are built in the 1830s during what was called then the famous Greek Revival. And the architect was Russell Warren, a very important architect of the early 1800s in this country. Next one is the Grinnell Mansion. Now this is a, was a private home at the time. As you can see, the massiveness of this, of, of the stone and its columns and so on. And finally, the Unitarian Church. Now at this church, a man who was known as Ralph Waldo Emerson preached for a couple of years. And perhaps the most famous uh, of preachers, Orville Dewey, also preached there. But after this revival, coming up into the 1860s, we come into a more genteel period of New Bedford architecture. And one, of course, is best, out, uh, uh, best shown by what is called in New Bedford the Roach Crapo Bullard Mansion. Here you can see the, the beauty is more important than the, the real strength. And turning from the, the architecture to the painting aspect of New Bedford, New Bedford, of course, for many years in the 1800s was a very important art colony. And the first uh, painter of importance was a man named Albert Pinkham Ryder. Next to him was a man named Albert Bierstadt, famous, perhaps most famous for his Western scenes. Following him was a man named William Bradford. And Bradford's work is known best uh, as, as an Arctic painter. Finally, there was in the, actually in the 1900s, Clifford Ashley, the painter of whaling scenes. These, all of these paintings hang at the Free Public Library in the city of New Bedford, and we'd like very much to have you come down and see them. Finally, the, the formal aspect of, of, of whaling uh, and, its, and, its, uh, and its heritage was brought out with the, the primitive and the informal, the popular. Now, of course, the, here is a picture painted in the 1840s by some whalemen, we don't know who, but showing the, the very fine example of very fine primitive paintings. I'm going back to the, the popular again, Ted, uh, how, how about some, some, what they had some other songs, didn't they? Yeah, why don't I sing the song that we sing at the beginning and end of the show? Right, here, right. Without the seagulls. All right. <laughs> It was advertised in Boston, New York, and Buffalo. 500 brave Americans wailing for the go, singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho. All away your running gear and blow, boys, blow. They'll take you to New Bedford, a famous whaling port. Give you to some land sharks to board and fit you out, singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho. All the way you're running gear and blow, boys, blow. Now we're at the sea, my boys, the winds begin to blow. One half the watch is sick on deck and the other half below. Singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho. All the way you're running gear and blow, boys, blow. The captain's on the quarter deck a squinting at the whales. Up above the look I sights a whopping school of whales singing blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho All the way you're running gear and blow boys blow It's over with the boats my boys and to his side we'll travel But if we get too near his flukes he'll kick it to the devil singing blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho All the way you're running gear and blow boys blow now we get them stuck, my boys, we'll bring them alongside. Over with a blubber hook and rob him of his hide. Singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho. All the way you're running gear and blow, boys, blow. Now we're back in port, my boys, and through with all this sailing. We'll open up a jug of rum and the hell with blubber whaling. Singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds high ho. All the way you're running gear and blow, boys, blow. Oh, thank you, Ted. That, of course, is our national anthem down in New Bedford, as you well know. Of course, no, none of our shows is complete without a visit with our 
very favorite whaler, Mr. Reginald Hegarty. Mr. Hegarty? No uh, program on whaling is complete unless we talk about scrimshaw. This was a purely uh, American art developed by the whalemen. And today we have with us uh, Mr. Milton Delano from Fairhaven, town across the river from New Bedford. And he's one of the main uh, practices of this art of scrimshaw. Just what is scrimshaw, Milton? Uh, thank you for asking me, Mr. Haggerty, because uh, as we have our folk song and folk song singing, uh, it is strictly uh, an original American folk art and is the art of carving or of engraving whale bone or whale ivory. For example, uh, this happens to be an old piece of scrimshaw, which is a carving of a jagged wheel. Uh, we have here a base relief carving on a sperm whale tooth showing a sulfur bottom whale. Well, Milton, just how is this done? Uh, actually, it's, I try to do it, Mr. Haggerty, the same way that the uh, whalemen who originated this art uh, in the same fashion and the same methods. However, I have one advantage. Uh, they took a great deal of time because of poor tooling and of what they had to work with. I have the advantage of being able to use some of the finest steels procurable, and uh, it doesn't really take a talent to be able to do this. Well, can anybody do it? Could you uh, give us some idea about just how it's done so somebody wanted to pick up the... First, let me show two or three pieces of real old Scrimshaw. You'll notice that this one right here that I placed in front of me is done with all little dots placed closely together. It is possible that some whaleman had taken a picture of uh, the person that is of and laid it over the tooth and just pricked very lightly and then afterwards pricked even harder. You'll notice this other old tooth Looks almost like a mechanical drawing close to. Uh, I think you will find that that was used as uh, many people could do today if they wanted to try scrimshaw by using a template or a, anything a straight edge or anything that would lie flat over the curved surface of the tooth that would be able to uh, do the mechanical type scrimshaw. Could you uh, show us perhaps a little how it is done? I notice you have your tools there. Yes, I brought brought my tools and uh, basically you have to start off first with a tooth as you That's right. can be well aware. Uh, a tooth, as many people think, do not come polished as this large tooth here. Instead they come very rough and very dirty. So the first thing you have to do naturally is clean the tooth and then by use Using uh, wood rafts or files, you just start filing down on the tooth. Also, you can use pieces of steel cut flat and scrape in that method. That's a little quicker. That is the quickest way to do it. However, the main objective, if you are going to engrave, or the engraving part of Scrimshaw, which I have the most of here, is the important thing is a very, very smooth surface. The object is to close all the pores. After you have filed, however, you start off with various grits of paper. Now, at this point, it is a very good idea to save all your little filings and chips. What do you use those for? When you get down to the final polish and using light cloths, cloths your final polish is done with the ivory chips and rubbed in your hands. It has been said that uh, on various uh, whaling cruises that they started off with the uh, Coopers who had calloused hands for the rough polishing and ended up with some of the boys in the galley who had flour on their hands and the cooking products and their hands were smooth to get a final polish. In other words, they had to have, even on the hands, they had to have different uh, grades of, of skin. Right. Also, it has uh, also been noted, uh, everything has come either from people who have had the experience, like yourself, I've had to find out from them, but it has also uh, should be noted that, as you'll see in some of these older teeth, you'll see that some of the drawing is very crude. To me, the old scrimshaw that is on this table is worth all of the ones that I have done put together, for the plain reason that uh, 
That is the original. I noticed that they are darker than the others. What makes them so dark? Age. Age? Age is what makes them dark. And uh, I understand you made uh, uh, tooths, you and uh, Scrimshaw a tooth for the president. Yes, I'm happy to say that the former president, President Kennedy, was one of the greatest sponsors of uh, Scrimshaw in the world today, in the present era, and had probably the largest private collection. As Attorney General, General Robert Kennedy said on uh, a while back on his drive to this memorial library, he had few teeth that uh, belonged to the president, but it was the president's uh, uh, wish that every Christmas and every birthday that he received a piece of item in Scrimshaw. This here was the one that Mrs. Kennedy, or Jacqueline Kennedy, ordered for Christmas present for Christmas of 1962. The original tooth, for comparative size, you can see where the ruler in the background is cut off at nine and one half inches. The mate of the tooth and as far as the position in the jaw was this tooth right here. Oh, I'd say that tooth there came from a whale that must have been at least 90 foot long. That, Mr. Hagerty, you would know more about than I. However, very quickly, I would like to show a chance someone is interested if they ever wanted to try this, they get the tooth, very important, get a very fine polish. This one I have cut down a little on polish so there wouldn't be too much reflection, but it's a basic uh, illustration of stripping a jar of teeth for the purpose of scrimshaw. All I have actually done there is outlined it. There are places, and incidentally I am now using a phonograph needle for a novice uh, type of thing that anybody would like to try, and just doing some basic shading. After one has scratched in all the lines, they, they just smear on. Now you can use lamp black, you can use Higgins ink, any type of waterproofing. The feature being that where you have polished, you have closed the pores, where you have scratched, you've opened. You allow a few seconds for that to dry. And a damp cloth, and when you have taken off the Of course, it's always good to moisten it because saliva will cut ink better than water. But when you have taken off, you see that I've added the shading into the drum where they are saving the teeth. That's interesting. Is that the way you do it all? Some I have tried in color, as this one of Mark Twain and this Sioux Indian. Well, the principle is the same on all The principle is exactly yeah. the same, except don't make the mistake and start off with a light color, because when you put a dark on, you uh, naturally would get the lights the dark also. Oh, I see. This one here, I would not call Scrimshaw. It happens to, was done special for the premiere of Moby Dick when it was in the Bedford a few years ago. That happens to be, uh, let's say, ivory uh, miniature or a casein on ivory. Well, then, as I am to understand you, what really is scrimshaw is something made out of ivory, that is, the whale's teeth, or perhaps the jawbone. Or the whalebone. Uh, anything else uh, is not really scrimshaw. It is done in the same method, but not scrimshaw. Oh, I see. Scrimshaw is the art of carving or engraving whalebone or whale ivory. Do they use any other material in conjunction with this? Uh, they've used ebony and mother of pearl, but the main uh, art is scrimshaw. Well, thank you, Milton. That, uh, I guess, I think the people will have some idea of how that is, and now we'll turn it back to Mr. Healy. Thank you, gentlemen. That's, uh, that's quite an art, quite an art. Ted, I think we've got time for about one more song. Can you sing us another one? All right, we'll sing another folksal song here, a song about piracy. There were two lofty ships from old England came, blow high, blow low. So sailed we, one was the Prince of Luther and the other Prince of Wales, down along the coast of High Barbary. Look aloft, look aloft, our jolly boats and cried, blow high, blow low. So sailed we, look ahead, look astern, look to weather, look to lee, down along the coast of High Barbary. 
is not upon the stern and is not upon the lee. Blow high, blow low, so sail it we. But there's a lofty ship to windward and she's sailing fast and free down along the coast of High Barbary. We're not a man of war nor a privateer, said he. Blow high, blow low, so sail it we. We are a salt sea pirate and we're looking for a fee down along the coast of High Barbary. There's broadside and broadside along while we lay. Blow high, blow low, so sail it we until the Prince of Luther shot the pirate's mass away down along the coast of High Barbary. Oh mercy, oh mercy, the pirate then cried he, blow high, blow low, so sail it we. But the mercy that we showed him was to sink him in the sea, down along the coast of High Barbary. Not a great piece, eh? Hey, you, uh, you know, I know it's one thing about your singing, Ted. Uh, I don't know if you're supposed to, but you're the first one I've been able to understand. Well, that shows I'm not authentic. Oh, I see. That, that, that's how it's done. Well, uh, I certainly want to thank Mr. Hegarty and Mr. Delano and, of course, Mr. Wood for your very, very fine singing. We certainly appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And I want to mention again uh, our book list about whaling. We've had quite a number of requests for a book list on whaling. Write Whaling, Box 902, New Bedford, Massachusetts. And if those who have already written in haven't received theirs yet, uh, it won't be too long before you do. But again, write Whaling, Box 902, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Send me one. I will. I will. The final telecast in our series of Whaling Day's features will be two weeks from tonight, the 16th of April. And at that time, uh, Jim Healy and Reginald Hegarty will explore the folklore and the legend of whaling. This has been Whaling Days out of New Bedford on Dateline Boston. It is advertised in Boston, New York, and Buffalo. 500 brave Americans whaling for the go. Singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds, I ho. All away you're running here and blow, boys, blow. They'll send you to New Bedford, a famous whaling port, and give you to some land sharks to board and pitch you out, singing, blow you winds in the morning and blow you in high hope. All away you're running here and blow, boys, blow. And now we're out to see my boys, the winds begin to blow. One half the watch is sick on deck and the other half below.